everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beginner Breakdown. My name, as always, is Alex, and I'm excited to be showing you tonight's uh, topic. So I've done some stuff like this before, um, where I take one of the pieces in the game and do kind of an overall analysis of uh, what are some of the major factors of this piece. So we did that with, I believe, the knight so far and um, the rook. So feel free to check out those videos. Um, today we're going to talk about the most ambitious piece on the chessboard, which is actually, depending on who you ask, not even a piece at all. We're going to look at the pawns. Um, now, the pawns are, I call them the most ambitious for two reasons. One, because they only move forward, right? So they're never looking back, they're never looking to the side, they're only looking forward. Um, and because they're the only piece that has the ability to change, right? And they can improve. If they make it all the way to their goal by forward progress, then they can promote. Um, so pawns are really weird. They got a lot of weird rules with them. Um, we're not gonna be going over exactly the rules for them today. So like en passant and that kind of thing. If you're not sure some of those, feel free to do a little checking up on your own. But we are gonna talk about some of just the really basic things that are good to know and may, might be helpful to you when dealing with pawns. The first thing about pawns, and I'm gonna kind of go through the stages of the game. So like the opening and then the middle game and then the end game. When we think about pawns in the opening, I think there's really two really important things, right? One is you want them to occupy or control these center squares. So, you know, playing moves like e4, e5, d4, d5 are very classical, very principled openings. Um, controlling the center is a good thing on its own and getting the pawns out of the way not only helps you do that, but also will allow you to develop your other pieces uh, easier. So that's really the main thing. However, you also, you, it's not just that you want them to control the center, you also don't want to move your pawns in a way that's going to endanger your king. So often in the beginning, it's best to start with these center ones. Occasionally, you'll see someone start with like one of the wing pawns, but generally these are not as strong openings most of the time. Um, maybe if you only push it one, it can be okay, a little more conservative. Um, the rook pawn's also usually not so good. Um, sometimes a beginner strategy is to play something like uh, bring the pawn out to develop the rook, which makes sense as the rook is an active piece. Unfortunately, in the long run, this is not a very good way to play because this rook is gonna become a big target and it's just kind of clunky out in the middle of the board. It would usually prefer to stay on the back row hitting a long line. But today's not about rooks, today's about pawns. And besides controlling the center, they really, in the beginning, serve as a shield for really all of your pieces, but most importantly, your king. This is why, um, you know, one probably one of the most famous ways to get a checkmate in the beginning, besides the scholar's mate or the form of checkmate, is the fool's mate. This is the fastest way to lose a game of chess. And there's a few variations on how it can happen, but the basic idea is uh, white is going to move these two pawns, the G pawn up two, F pawn one or two, it doesn't make a difference. And you'll notice that this opens up this really uh, important diagonal. There's now an avenue to attack the king. And so black can play queen to h4 on move two. And this is actually checkmate, the game is over. And it doesn't matter whether this pawn is up one or two. This pawn could be back one space as well. But as long as these two pawns have moved and the queen is able to develop, that's all it takes because no piece can block this check and the king has nowhere safe to move. So in the beginning, you want the pawns to be controlling the center and you also want to recognize their job as a shield. Um, kind of the inverse of that is true. So something that I've talked about before, the opening principles, right? The first one is control the center. Second one is develop your pieces, you know, get your knights, bishops into the game, especially. And the third one is keep your king safe. You can look at all of those and also kind of invert them. So we could say, if you're gonna play a move in the opening that actually you know, inhibits your opponent taking space in the center, or that stops them from developing their pieces to good squares, or that endangers their king, then those are also going to be very good, right? If it's good for you, it's bad for them, and so on and so forth. So uh, not only do you want to use them to guard your king, but also, uh, you want to use them to attack your opponent's king. So this comes, I think, most clearly when one side is castled 
uh, in one direction and the other side the other one. So one side kingside castles, the other side queenside castles. Um, because now you'll have your pawns, let's imagine black queenside castles here. These pawns, um, especially these three, are really going to want to stay back, keep the king safe. Whereas we're going to want to launch these pawns at our opponent. And the opposite is true for white. And I, to show you that as kind of an example, I want to look at a, a game that I found uh, that happened uh, quite a while ago um, between Alapin and a Harmonist. And in this position, Alapin had white. We're going to start with him. So pawn moves to e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, all very standard stuff. You know, like we said, controlling the center, developing our pieces. And uh, Alapin plays this move c3. So this is the Ponziani. Um, Alapin is actually more famous for playing c3 against the Sicilian. The c3 Sicilian is kind of just named after him. Um, but we see this c3 idea here as well. Um, doing really two main things. One, it is primarily supporting the pawn to d4. So uh, white would love to play this pawn to d4, but if we do it too quickly, then they're just going to take and it's not going to be as good. Now that we have a c pawn supporting this push, uh, if black captures, we can recapture and maintain our strong center. And we're going to see the importance later on of having uh, what uh, some people would call a pawn duo, right? Two pawns right next to each other. Um, and especially one in the center. Um, Harmonist here plays actually I think the most precise move, which is pawn to d5, immediately disrupting uh, white's plans here in the center. There's not time to push d4 now because we will lose this pawn on e4 and it gets a little complicated. Um, instead of pushing or taking, Alapin plays queen to a4, putting a pin on this knight and some pressure now because this piece is pinned, it's, it can't move and it's not protecting anything anymore. So there's now a threat of maybe playing knight takes e5 and putting additional pressure on this knight. And to uh, kind of alleviate that, Harmonist plays this move f6, which is a bit unusual. Um, not for this position. In this position actually it's one of the best moves. But generally, as we said, you don't usually want to move these pawns. Um, and what's the reason for that? Well, it's not in the center. And this one actually is giving that same diagonal to your king that we saw before. So what's the difference between this and the previous position? Um, well, the main difference is there's not actually a way to attack this right now. This bishop is undeveloped, so it can't really get over here. And Alapin already moved his queen out of the way. It's now on the other side of the board. So in order to take advantage of this weakness, he would have to, you know, reroute his queen or develop the bishop and get this knight out of the way. It's going to take a few moves, which means um, Harmonist is going to have plenty of time to shore up this defensive weakness, um, and it's worthwhile for him to defend the center in this way. So that's why this move is played, even though it's usually atypical. Uh, Alapin continues with pressure on the knight with bishop to b5, um, now just threatening to capture twice and fork the king and the rook. And here, uh, Harmonist responds with knight e7. Bishop d7 will seem sensible as well, um, but it also makes sense to develop this knight seeing as it can no longer get to f6. Pawn takes d5, queen takes d5, castles, and bishop e6. And now we can see that even though the dark squared bishop is a little trapped by this knight, that's okay because uh, Harmonist is looking to queenside castle which happens very quickly. d4, pawn takes, c takes, and queenside castle. And now that we have kind of clarified the position a little bit, we understand what's happening. Um, as we talked about before, one very general idea with the pawns is you want to keep the ones in front of your king safely shielding it. And you want to, uh, if you're the opponent, you want to try and break through that shield. So. White is looking to keep these pawns, you know, tucked back, safely guarding the king, occupying and controlling these really important squares near the king. Whereas white's going to want to push the A and B pawns down the line to try and break through black's kind of uh, queenside castle. And black is going to be doing the opposite on our side. The question is who's going to be able to do it first and how are they going to mobilize their pieces to assist in this matter? So let's see what happens here. Uh, okay, knight to c3, attacking the queen, gaining some time. Queen goes to f5, out of the way. 
bishop to e3, defending d4, and lining up with this castle. Also just developing. And pawn to g5. So Harmonist isn't wasting any time, immediately begins to try and storm the castle. Rook f to c1, uh, lining up with the king. So these pawns have been pushed initially, but we can see that pressure is starting to mount against Harmonist here. Uh, there's a lot of just a lot of peace activity and a lot of potential for threats to be released in this position. h5, continuing forward, and now Alapin plays b4, beginning to move forward with the pawns. h4, and knight back to e1. This is kind of a, an interesting move, perhaps preparing for pawn to uh, g4, then where the knight's going to have to move anyway. And going to e1, um, likely just because of where the knight wants to route. Um, it could be going, you know, in this direction maybe, uh, or possibly here later on. It's also controlling some of these squares. So let's see. So g4, as we predicted, and now the knight would have had to move anyway. Uh, bishop to d3, pulling back, attacking the queen, and now we can also see another reason for knight to e1 to support this bishop, and getting out of the way to allow the pawns to continue to charge forward. Queen to h5, getting out of the way, and pawn to b5. The knight doesn't really have any good squares. Um, we can see that the queen controls these two. The pawn uh, is defended adequately on d4 and certainly controls. So the only real move here is knight to b8, um, which unfortunately allows now queen takes a7, as the knight was previously defending that pawn. And we can see black's position already starting to slightly crumble. Bishop to h6, activating this piece, defending the rooks, maybe putting some challenge on white's bishop on e3. And white simply continues by moving in for the kill. Knight to a4, uh, controlling b6, potentially preparing pawn to b6 to try and break through, put more pressure. Rook to d6, looking to try and mitigate some of this, perhaps hoping to reroute and get a strong uh, attack in the center, but also just hoping to control the sixth rank a little better and maybe do something to stop this. But unfortunately, there's a really nice move played now by Alapin, who recognizes that with the knight out of the way, the rook that he put on c1 so long ago is now pinning this pawn, allowing for knight to b6 check. Um, you could move the king, but then the knight falls, so rook takes and queen takes b6. Now, checkmate is threatened from the rook and the queen, so pawn to c6, but because this pawn has already advanced, it's able to tear down the shields, b takes c6, knight from e takes c6, rook a to b1, making another uh, nearly checkmate threat. The king would have an escape, but it's not gonna be pretty. And queen to f7 to defend. And in this position, Alapin played one more move before Harmonist resigned. He played the move uh, really beautiful, bishop to a6, putting just too much pressure. There's no way to hold this position. Um, and there's a few ideas. You can't take this bishop because then uh, queen takes b8, because again, this knight is still pinned. Our rook on the c file is too powerful. So the king will move and we get a checkmate very quickly. Okay, what else is there? You can't take, what if the knight takes instead? Well, if the knight takes, then there's actually a really pretty sacrifice. Rook takes c6, pawn takes, queen takes a6. So we've sacked the rook for two knights, which is uh, good for us. King moves and check. We could take this free rook, but you can do even better with queen to a3 check. We could take this queen, but you can also still do better here with queen to a5 and checkmate is forced because if you move this way, I have mate in two. And if you move this way, I have mate in one. The bishop can no longer block. The only other move would be to sack the queen, which I will take and follow up with a checkmate. So regardless, there's not really anything that black can do to get out of this, um, and it will result in a checkmate very quickly. So harmonist resign in this position. But I do like this game because it shows the, the basic idea, you know, both players pushing forward, trying to break through. It just so happened that 
even though um, Harmonis started the pawn storm sooner, uh, the peace activity wasn't quite all together and White's pieces were coordinated and able to line up a really nice attack. Um, so that's kind of the basics of how to use the pawn with the king. The thing with the king, and we're going to look at a few of the other pieces, are the king's relationship with the pawns is very proportional based on how many pieces are on the board. So the more pieces on the board, the more the king is going to use pawns as a shield to keep the king safe. Versus the less pieces are on the board, then the more the king actually becomes a very active piece and will actually be involved in assisting the pawns on their journey to promotion. Um, so that's really what you want to keep in mind with the, the uh, pawns and the king. Now we're going to look at the pawns with every other piece. So we're going to look at the knights, the bishops, and the rooks. And the queens we're kind of going to skip over because the main concern now is about the pawn structure and how that is going to interact with various pieces. And the queen is a you know powerful and versatile enough piece that she can kind of adjust and adapt to whatever structure the pawns are in. So she doesn't have anything really specific with how to play with the pawns, but the other pieces absolutely do. So to take an example of a few of that, we're going to start with the bishops. How do the bishops and the pawns uh, interact? Uh, so they do so in a few ways, um, but the first one is this concept of like a good or a bad bishop. I need power. This thing is going to die. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, I think I gave a lecture on good and bad bishops. So feel free to check that out if it's online. I don't remember if we streamed it. But the basics are um, really with any piece. In order to evaluate if it's doing something well or not, if it's a good or bad piece in the position, you need to uh, determine um, how active it is, how much mobility it has, right? So there's a saying that a knight on the rim is grim or dim. Uh, and that's because a knight on the edge of the board is only going to control a handful of spaces. That worked. Um, versus if a knight's in the center, yeah, yeah. Uh, a knight in the center is going to control a whole lot more. Well, we want to look at the same with the bishops. So bishops prefer games that are open, um, which we'll look at in a second, but they also look at the color, right? Because bishops can only occupy one color of the board, uh, we call them like the light squared and the dark squared because of which squares they can occupy. Which squares the pawns are on actually matters a whole lot. So notice in this position that all of um, white's pawns are on the dark squares and all of black's pawns are on these light squares. And now look at the color bishops they have. We both have a light squared bishop. So because of that, white is actually doing a lot better, even though the, the material is almost equal. I think white's up a pawn. Um, the material's very close to even, but white is significantly better because their bishop is actually able to maneuver around in between all of their own pawns and simply make threats against their opponent's pawns. Whereas black's bishop here, uh, is relegated purely to defense. It can only keep its pawns defended, but it can't actually maneuver that well. It can't go through them or past them, and it can't make any threats against white's pawns. So when considering how the pawns work with your bishops, right? if you have bishops left on the board or your opponent does, you really wanna look at where your pawns are placed, if they're on the right color square, and how you can you know, activate your bishop. One of the most popular openings nowadays for white is the London defense, or sorry, the London system. And it has this idea where um, white basically will occupy all of these light squares. I'm just going to play some sample moves here. But you know, something like this, and white's going to continue development. But the basic idea is white is putting all their pawns on these dark squares and forming this nice defensive formation. And so they very quickly bring their bishop out on the outside of that formation so that it's able to you know, move around and fight against black's pieces. Because if it's sitting here on C1, it wouldn't be doing very much. So um, that's kind of uh, the same principle here, is you want to be aware of how you're using your pawns and what color they're occupying, um, depending on what color bishop you have or your opponent has, and so on and so forth. 
Another thing that the bishops care about in regards to pawns are, you know, whether the position is open or closed. So when I say an open or closed position, you're looking specifically at these two center files, the E and D file, and whether there are pawns occupying and locked up there or not. So in this case, the pawns are just totally absent, which means that um, bishops are gonna be a lot better than the knights, right? The knights don't mind when pieces are locked up, which we will see later, because they can jump around and reposition themselves wherever they need to go. But bishops like long open diagonals where they can roam free and attack a whole massive line. So uh, the bishops are actually dominating. White in this position is significantly better because they have the bishop pair, whereas black with a knight and a bishop is not as good because these bishops can just occupy so much space. Um, in contrast, as we just mentioned, in this position, this bishop is dominated for two reasons. One, it's kind of bad, right? We just talked about the same color pawns as the bishop, so it can't really move as far. Um, but also, because these pawns are kind of locked up, now this is a knight instead of a pawn, but the idea is the same. Mobility of all these pawns is severely restricted, which means that the bishop is not going to be able to do much because these pawns can't move out of its way. Whereas the knight can jump around again to wherever it needs to, to get through these defenses. Um, it, can sw it switches colors every turn, and so anything that's reducing mobility in the position, which with the pawns happens a lot, right? Anytime where I don't want to push a pawn because I'll lose it, like a backwards pawn, or an isolated pawn that can't really move because it's not protected in front. Um, pawns that are doubled, so any two pawns that are on the same file that can't move very easily, any positions like that, the knights are going to prefer. Um, okay, so that's knights and bishops, and we looked at the king first. Now let's look at the rooks real quick. So rooks and pawns also have an interesting relationship, and I'd say it's fairly similar to the bishops. Um, any piece that attacks in a straight line, whether it's the queen, the bishop, the rook, um, all of them are doing a lot better in the game when they have access to long open spaces. Um, so in this position, it is white to move, and there's actually one move that's just absolutely crushing in this position. I, I know I haven't really in interacted with the chat or uh, our audience here too much yet, so I'll give you a little bit of a chance to do so now. If you want to take a look at this position for white and see if you can come up with a really good idea, what, what would be a, a great way for white to improve the position? All right, someone in the chat, uh, Squizzard Kid, I believe is your name. Uh, you have the right idea. It's pawn takes pawn on uh, d5. And the reason is because we're gonna open this file for the rook and allow our piece to really get in the game. And this position is actually so problematic, like allowing this rook to invade is so bad for black that the computer says the best move here is to not recapture, it's to, to lock up this position, allowing us to defend our extra pawn. So the, the computer would rather let us just have that pawn totally for free than give our rook any room to invade. And I think it's justified in doing so because well, you can't really take with the rook because then I just win this pawn. And if you take with the pawn, then now you can see how dangerous the rook becomes. It's going to invade on the seventh rank. Um, and if you don't act very quickly, so one, you need to defend this pawn somehow. So you can either push it or move the rook to defend. But whatever you do, I can now double up the rooks and take almost total control. And very quickly, yeah, you can't do this because this is a checkmate. So if black plays some other move, something like this, let's say, just anything else, then white can very quickly double their rooks on the seventh. And this is, I mean, black is almost getting checkmated here. Um, you're attacking these pawns. And yeah, there's just really nothing you can do. The position is crumbling and totally lost, all because white was able to invade with these rooks. Um, 
because white knew to open the position with these pawns. So having like a position where there's tension here, right? These two pawns can take each other um, or not. They could push past, but having this kind of option open can be really helpful when you have pieces like rooks and bishops that like long open spaces. Um, Fat Chicken Legs in the chat asks, what is the best opening for beginners? It's a tough question. There's a lot of really good ones. Um, I would say openings where you understand the ideas really well and they don't require a lot of long memorization of forced lines. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities there. Really depends, but um, I think I did a lesson on openings that I would encourage you to check out. Okay. Another thing with the pawns, this isn't like a major thing, but this is a pattern that I see a lot in beginner games. Um, and I want to show it through just a kind of a sample game that one of my students sent me. I've adapted it slightly to illustrate the point a little better. Um, but let's just take a look at this game. So it starts out the same as that Alapin Harmonist game, but this time it's an Italian. So bishop to c4, bishop c5, d3, and you know, just some normal development moves. A lot of beginners have probably played a game that looks something like this. And we can understand most of the ideas. Now in this position, bishop g5, um, knight e7 is an unusual move. Uh, one, because we've already moved this piece, but it's doing two things. It's breaking the pin from this queen. And also, even though we can uh, double the pawns here, if white wants to kingside castle, then maybe this is a bit dangerous, you know, activating this rook, opening up the file for it to attack. So it seems at least reasonable. Now white's probably better if they make this trade and then just queenside castle. But regardless, um, that's a little beyond the scope of this lecture. Queen d2, a5, uh, white kingside castles, and black plays c6. And my question to you is in this position, it's white to move. What is the threat? Because there is kind of a, a veiled threat in this position that some people won't notice. So yeah, take a second in the chat if you want to try and figure it out. Um, but there's a very serious threat that black is kind of looking to play if you're not careful. What is it that we have to be watching out for? And if you're watching later, feel free to pause the video, but hello, play chess uh, and Donnie have both found the idea, Lifetime 42. Yeah, so this is a pattern that's really familiar to some players. It happens a lot. And it's called the Noah's Ark pattern. I don't actually know why. I don't know if it's like a two by two thing, but the idea is we are gonna trap this bishop with our pawns. Uh, so if white isn't very careful and just plays some move, then pawn to b5, okay. And we look and say, okay, where can this bishop go? Well. This pawn is defended, this square is defended, this square is defended, this square is attacked. So we have to back off. And now a4. And you're like, wait, how on earth did this happen? Uh, I'm going to now have to sacrifice my bishop for a pawn just because I got trapped like this? How, how does this happen? And it's very subtle. Uh, I believe in the game originally sent by my student, uh, it was slightly different. It was a little less subtle. In that game, the moves were c6, castles. Uh, b5, pushing the bishop back, and then a5. And now it's very clear what the threat is, right? It's very sequential. But because the order happened a little differently, first a5 with the idea that, okay, we're going to slowly take away these spaces and see if they notice, and then it, we're not going to give them this extra move. Because if you play it, you know, the, the, the first way, then now in this position, it's a lot easier to see that a4 is a threat and I can just play some move like pawn to a3 and be alive. But if you play something like this, a5 and then c6, I don't know, maybe c6 is looking towards d5 or you know, uh, to open up this queen. There's a lot of different reasons this move might have happened. And so someone might not be immediately thinking pawn to b5 and to a4. So keep an eye out for this pattern. Um, there's two actual kind of positions or like openings that it's really famous for. One of them is uh, the Sicilian defense. So here we could look at a game e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, pawn to d6, bishop b5. Already there's a little bit of a potential danger here because if we just play the pawn to a6, then now this bishop cannot retreat to a4. 
if they go like back in the middle, then it's probably fine. But if they go to a4, then they've fallen for the trap because our pawn is already on c5. So pawn to b5, bishop b3, c4, and the bishop is completely trapped. The same pattern here. And one more example actually comes out of the Roy Lopez opening. This one is a little more complex, so I'm not going to go super, super deep into it. But the basic ideas are we enter the Roy Lopez or Spanish opening with bishop to b5, pawn to a6, a very normal response here, bishop a4, d6. And white is kind of, uh, there's a very logical move that a lot of people would want to play, which is pawn to d4. Um, you know, crashing forward, opening up room to develop the bishop. It's a very sensible move in a lot of positions, but here it runs into the issue, pawn to b5. Okay, bishop goes to b3, getting out of the way. And now knight takes d4, a really nice move. With the idea that we're grabbing a pawn and forcing white to recapture, takes, takes, queen takes, you know, trying to pick that pawn back up. But now you can sort of see we're going to get a tempo on this queen with c5. The queen's going to have to move out of the way and we're going to push to c4, c5. And um, white can try and play a little tricky with queen to d5, you know, threatening to win our rook, not giving us time. But if we simply play a move like bishop e6, attacking the queen and defending the rook with our queen, the queen will have to move. We can say they move to c6 again to complicate it with a check, but once again, simply dropping the bishop back is good enough. And there is nothing here to do. You have to save the queen, which allows c4. And the bishop is eventually trapped. So just do keep an eye out for this pattern. Again, you don't have to know it as complex as this specific opening. Um, but this kind of idea of moving the pawns forward, sometimes obviously, sometimes subtly, but trapping the bishop back, taking away all these squares, uh, is a pattern that I do see a lot in lower level games. So I wanted to share that with you here. Um, another thing that the pawns are really good at is forks. So in this position, the move is probably fairly obvious, but uh, pawn forks are something that's really simple and also really easy to overlook uh, because you don't often look for, you know, how is this piece going to uh, help me tactically, right? We're thinking more strategically about the structure, which color is, is it on? Is it connected or not, you know? Um, but when you have an opportunity, right, when two of your opponent's pieces are just sort of next to each other, but not right next to each other, sometimes you'll have this opportunity for a really nice pawn fork. So do keep that in mind as well. Um, one more example that I think is a really fun one is this position. In this position, you probably can find the move because I gave you a little bit of a hint based on the topic. But if anyone wants to take a guess at the move and the idea, what is White's kind of plan to gain an advantage here? Or actually, in this position, we're actually down a little bit of material. Notice how we only have a bishop and knight versus two bishops, or sorry, two knights and a bishop. So we're down a knight for, I think, a pawn, um, although one of those pawns is doubled. So black is really doing quite well here, uh, except we have one nice tactical resource, which, yeah, a few people in the chat are already finding, and it's this idea of pawn to c4, first displacing the knight, and then moving farther forward to c5 which doesn't look like on its own it would be very good because you're like, wait, the bishop will just take. It's not actually a fork because that pawn's not defended. But then you realize once this knight is out of the way, our rook will pin the bishop to the king. And we get this really nice sequence. You cannot take because your bishop is pinned and this is an effective fork. So do keep looking out for these one famous example of like a pawn fork is actually called the fork trick, and it's an opening that comes out of the four knights. Um, and it's, you know, very simple. We play the four knights, or I'm sorry, the three knights. Uh, I think there's a way to get it in the four knights as well, but um, certainly in the three knights. So in this position, uh, white actually has another pretty interesting move that, um, I think it's fairly even or balanced at intermediate level, but it can give a nice advantage at uh, higher levels if you know what you're doing. 
So in this position, it's white to move. How can we gain an advantage? Some of you might play this position. If you do, feel free to, to share. Uh, if you don't, this is a nice learning opportunity here. Uh, D4 is, I think, a fine move. Um, it might be a little gambity, but it's probably possible to play. Um, but yeah, a few other people are finding the idea, and it's actually to make this temporary sacrifice. Knight takes e5. In order to put these two pieces, now we can play d4, and we're going to pick it up. And so we're actually getting a pawn here, because um, a, a lot of people will just take this pawn, and queen takes back. This is actually a bit of a problem for black. This it doesn't get seen at the high levels. Um, because now, okay, we don't want to move the knight. You're going to lose the g7 pawn. So something like d6. And white is basically going to get a lot of just extra time and pressure. Black is yet to castle. White is fully castle, fully mobilized, and ready to start an attack. Um, so instead of that, often what happens at higher levels when this is played, and this isn't played very often at higher levels, but it does happen, is instead to drop the bishop back to d6 and to take here. Um, and it's still an even game, but maybe white has a slight edge uh, just from some initiative, this piece having to move around a lot. So, yeah, so that's another useful example of kind of pawn forks. So keep those in your back pocket as well. A nice little tactical resource, and a lot of people overlook it at the beginning level. And now I want to look at a few different kind of really, I guess, critical pawn structures that are like the building blocks for almost every other one. I've talked about in previous lectures on like weaknesses, you know, double pawns and isolated pawns, connected pawns, past pawns. Um, we'll talk about those a little bit, but I'm not going to go through all of those since I've done it in another video. Uh, but I do want to talk about these structures. So here's the first one. Um, and all of these kind of names I actually found in a book I believe it's called just Pawn Power or something like that by Hans Kmock. Um, it's an old book, but really good information. And he says if we're looking at a position like this, right, where the two pawns are just in the way, then he calls this the ram. And imagine like two actual rams, you know, ramming their heads into each other and just locked in this conflict where neither can gain an advantage. That's basically what's happening here. Um, when the two pawns are pushing each other, it's a total impasse. The thing to know about this position that is maybe not obvious at first glance is that it actually is favoring uh, a side that's trying to defend rather than attack. Think about what I was saying earlier with the knights and their mobility. So a knight can kind of jump around and maneuver, and it does that better when these pawns are stuck. Rams lock up a lot of space and make it harder to do that invasion. So pieces like the bishops and the rooks the queens have a harder time breaking through. And additionally, just notice that they just occupy a lot of space in terms both of where they are placed, they can't move, and in terms of where they control, right? This is a big chunk of the board occupied by two little pawns. Um, so if you want to you know, make an attack in a position, often you're gonna try and break down these locked pawns, try and trade or uh, force captures, sometimes even make sacrifices in order to get them out of the way. Um, another thing that I think the, the ram type position shows us is one of the big weaknesses of pawns in general, which is actually, you know, they're, some people could say, okay, they're weak from the side or from behind or on, you know, these long diagonals. And all of that is true. But perhaps the biggest weakness they have is the square right in front of them. Um, and the reason is, not only sure they can be attacked from that way, but also because they don't have any means to attack it and that's the only direction they can move, if someone controls the square in front of a pawn, whether it's by another pawn or by dropping a piece there, then you really just cut off everything that pawn can do. So uh, that's something really, really uh, important to keep in mind. The square in front of a pawn is one of its biggest weaknesses. Let's contrast this with a different type of position. Now the two pawns are looking at each other, and Hans uh, Kamak called this type of position a lever. I think just because it literally maybe looks like a lever, but um, 
The idea here is unlike the previous position where it's just an impasse, very solid, very locked up, uh, this is a very tense position, right? There's a lot of pressure on who is going to exchange first or who's gonna push past. How is this pressure gonna be released? But right now there is the potential for a capture. Um, usually in chess, this, uh, unless there's a good reason to make an exchange, uh, sides, each side of the board will usually prefer to continue to add pressure to the position rather than release it. Because if you, you know, make this exchange with the pawns, then often whoever gets to recapture can gain space or develop one of their pieces or maybe gain some initiative. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Maybe a good example of that is something in like some French structures. So a very common idea in you know, these French type structures is we're going to kind of create this tension here. Usually it's either with C5 or F6 um, and kind of just continue to build on it, right? So like some very normal looking positions, neither side wants to make the trade because if you do, you are conceding something, right? If in this position, white simply takes, then we are helping black activate their pieces we are undefending our e5 pawn, which becomes a weakness. Conversely, if, um, if black takes, well, now a lot of the opportunity to continue to add pressure has gone away, right? It's going to be easier now for white to develop their pieces, and you, you sort of see the idea. So that's just a very basic rudimentary example of uh, this type of lever position, where the pawns are in tension. So again, it's just some more stuff to keep in mind with that. And perhaps one of the most important things to think about is this idea of pawn duos, is what Hans calls it in the book. Um, and a pawn duo is just two pawns that are next to each other. Sometimes they're right next to each other, sometimes one is pushed forward, and so one defends, the other is uh, at the top. Um, but these duos are really, really important um, for a few reasons. <laughs> Ted Bradley, you call these pawns bros. I love that. These pawns are now bros in my mind. Um, and the idea with the bros is they cover each other's weaknesses. So remember how we talked about uh, how the square right in front of a pawn is one of its biggest weaknesses? Well, if you have a pawn that's right next to it or able to move next to it, then you're covering that spot. They can kind of leapfrog with each other and help each other uh, all the way down the board. And just notice how much control they actually exert, right? With four pawns on the board, we actually control this entire rank the entire fifth rank is attacked just by two pawns. Um, you can't make any other setup with the pawns to do this, to control a whole row. But if you have two of them next to each other in this kind of nice, evenly spaced position, then it works. Um, which again goes to show just how valuable these things are, right? Both for supporting each other and for controlling space in general, right? This is a lot of pressure to have in the position. So keep an eye out for forming pawn duos, right? You would always rather have pawns be connected to each other than disconnected when given the choice. All right, another idea here. So before I kind of talk on this position, uh, let me ask the question to you all. It is white to move in this position, and we have the option to trade bishops. Should we trade or should we not? Uh, there's really no other move to consider here because um, we can't defend this bishop. So if we don't trade and we don't retreat it, then we're going to lose it. So why should we trade or why should we not trade? What do you think? I see Pumpkin the Cat. Yes, trade. Someone else said no. Someone says yeah. Uh, so we have a few back and forths. I like this debate. Trade bishop Oh, bishop e5, I should say, yeah, I did not consider this move. Bishop e5 is actually an interesting move to consider as well. Um, the problem with bishop e5, I will tell you that is not the move, is even though it's going to help you generate maybe a passed pawn, black's king is just way too close. Um, it's going to be able to take this pawn and still cover this one from promoting. So that's sadly not going to work. Um, but... Yeah, so most people I think are seeing the right idea. We actually in this position very much would like to trade. Um, retreating, I think, will result in a draw. I mean, it's basically an even position. 
and black will be able to re-coordinate themselves. But because black has allowed the trade in this position, their king is going to be too far behind and stuck. Notice in this position that black actually has no threats right now other than just trading this, just winning our bishop, right? We can't allow that. Um, but that's the only threat. The pawns themselves are not making any threats. Because even though they're equal, with these two doubled, th this pawn is, they're both completely stumped. They can't do anything. On their own, I should say. Now, if you could take some of these pawns, excuse me, sorry. If you could take some of these pawns, then it would be fine. But this king is too far away because it has a very important job. White has a passed pawn. If black's king goes too far away, this pawn will run. But it doesn't have to because it has, you know, part of these duos, um, these pawn bros are defending it in this nice triangle formation. And so white's king is going to be free to just march up the board and do whatever they want because black can't actually stop them. You either have to stop the king, which allows the pawn to move, or you stay and stop the pawn, which allows the king to totally invade. So in this position, we can simplify because we recognize that white has an incredible advantage in this structure that black just has no answer for. We have a, a threat of a passed pawn moving forward to promotion, and black has no potential counterplay whatsoever without the king, and they will need the king. So just play could continue something like this. Let's just see what the computer tries to do against me. All right, so they're going to stop, but now I can just push this pawn. The king will have to go back and catch it, and now I can step in. So this is what the computer is suggesting, and you can imagine a lot of other ways this plays out. But black will eventually have to concede something. Um, okay, and now that we've looked at this idea, I want to move kind of, we've looked at kind of some basic structures, some terminology in the opening, the middle game, and now we're into the end game. In the beginning, how we look at the, and the middle game, how we look at the pawns is really all about structure. Sometimes it's those nice tactical opportunities to trap a piece or, you know, get a fork. But generally speaking, it is more in the structure. Once we get to the end, this is where everything comes together towards pawn promotion. Because the way most games of chess end, um, other than maybe loss on time, is it's about both sides having a fairly even playing field, but one side being slightly more active with their pieces or their king, or one side being having an extra pawn or two, and being able to convert that into a win by promoting the pawn. Um, this example is really fascinating because in almost all cases, if you have a king that is in front of a pawn, so in this case, this pawn is going this way up the board to promotion. If you have a king in front of a pawn, it can almost always promote if your king is far enough ahead, able to control the key squares. In this position, that is false. Even though this king is way behind and this king is way uh, ahead, because this pawn is on the edge, it actually uh, is a draw. So something you may have heard is capture towards the center with your pawns. Um, I guess in general too, but uh, capturing towards the center, one, because it's going to alleviate this problem. Um, probably the main reason is because the center is usually more important and you want pieces to control those squares. So often capturing towards the edge doesn't make as much sense. But also, in this very specific case, if you have one extra pawn, it might not be enough. Um, in this position, I believe it does depend on whose move it is. So in this position, with black to move, black will hold the draw. If it was white to move, I think white actually does win because white can play something like king b6. And the idea is white needs to keep our king just out from getting... There's two things white needs to do here. Um, white needs to stop our king from getting into this corner um, because if our king can touch the a8 corner before this pawn gets there, then there's actually nothing white can do to dislodge us. They can either just move around forever and do nothing or force a stalemate. Um, to show kind of a very simple example of that is if white plays really badly here and just lets me take the corner, then there's actually just nothing that white can do to get me out of it. They can move their king around and I can just always stay in the corner. They will, I could take the pawn, I, I don't even have to. 
um, because at some point to try and make progress they will push and this is a stalemate because either they move away from the pawn and I take it or they move to defend it and I have no legal moves. So that's one thing white needs to do. They need to stop me from doing that, um, which king b6 actually I think allows. The second thing they need to stop me from doing is actually keeping this king locked on this file because then I can force a stalemate myself. So imagine something like this, right? We're gonna walk up the board. I'm gonna continue to take opposition and stop this king from ever leaving this wall. And I'm just gonna keep going back and forth and either you were eventually going to let me take the corner, which we already saw as a draw, or um, you will just box yourself in with your own pawn. And this is also a stalemate because I control all of these squares. So um, because of that, this is like the exception to the rule. Normally, if your king gets in front of the pawn, you're good. In this case, you, you can't have it be a rook pawn just because if white is winning with a rook pawn, it's the exception, not the rule. Um, so with pawn promotion, that's one thing is you want to, if you can, if you have the choice, right, between making a rook pawn or a non-rook pawn, you almost always want to make a non-rook pawn. Um, let's look at a, an example here of pawn promotion, something else that I think is insightful. So in this position, uh, material is equal. Both sides have four pawns and a rook. And the question is, what can black do here to win, right? We would love to play our pawn and promote, but what should we do to actually make sure that happens? All right, yeah, hello play chess has the idea, right? If we just play pawn to h2, then um, white can play rook to b1 and will be able to stop us. So that's not gonna be any good. The actual really nice move here is to sacrifice the rook. Rook to d1, a really beautiful move. Because now the king will take and actually get in the way of this rook controlling that square. Um, so th the reason I'm showing this example is less about the pawns and more just to show how valuable a passed pawn is, right? Because you can make any piece you need, usually it will be the queen, um, but not always. Because you can do that, then even sacking a rook in order to get that queen is gonna be worth it. So always keep the idea open of how can I help support the pawn? And so this is kind of an edge case where we can actually just blockade the file. So that's a really fun one. But um, there's some more common obstacles that I wanna walk through with you. So um, this position, don't worry so much about who can solve it. That wasn't really my intention. Um, it's more to notice the way these pawns are oriented. So uh, neither side here has passed pawns, but it's for a different reason. So these two pawns are not passed, either of them, uh, because the other one is in the way. And I believe in the book, uh, Hans Kmok calls this a mechanical obstruction or a mechanical obstacle. So like I will never, due to the mechanics of the game of chess, be able to promote this pawn so long as you have a pawn on the same file as me. Because they're just gonna be in their way forever and there's nothing that they can do independently of the other pieces. Contrast that with these two, which neither of these are past pawns, because not of a mechanical issue, it's not about the game, it's a dynamic issue. Because whenever one of them moves forward, the other one will control that square. So this one can be overcome, but you have to be more creative with it. Um, those are like the two basic issues. And if we continue, uh, we'll notice in a position like this that what we want to look out for are one, the mechanical problem. Do they have a pawn on the same file? Two, the, uh, do they have a pawn on the adjacent file, right? So like these two. And then ultimately the best kind of pawn is one where they don't have any of that. So this would be our true past pawn. They can't stop it in either way with their own pawns. Their own pieces are gonna have to get in the way and that's usually we can find a way to overcome that. So this is the easiest pawn to promote. And then you'll get a pawn, you know, like uh, 
say this one or this one, which it's possible with careful play to promote. Um, if, it, if it was whites to move and we can imagine some kings on the board somewhere, then pawn to d5 would be a really nice move to force a trade and create another passed pawn over here. Um, so these dynamic obstacles can be overcome through strong play, but a mechanical issue is the hardest to overcome. In order to get a pawn like this to promote, I will actually have to find a way to eliminate uh, the pawn in my way. Something else about promotion is similar to our first idea of sacrifices. Um, this is a really famous example. In this position, it's white to move, and black's king is far closer. So if we try and, you know, just move our king, black's king is going to beat us to the pawns, eat them all up, and win. So we don't have time to just wait. We have to do something quickly or black is just going to win. And there's actually a way to do it in this position. Um, and what you need to think about is your goal here is if you get any one of your three pawns to promote before black has a chance, even if they take the other two. If you can just get one to promote, you're good. So this is a hard example if you haven't seen it before, but if anyone wants to take a shot at finding white's winning idea here, then feel free to take a shot at the best move. And again, you wanna think about which spaces the pawns control and how can you force your way to get to the end uh, without your opponent being able to stop you. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about this one. And I think I will have one more thing after this and then we will switch over. But in this position, white to move, how can we win? Okay, b6 has been suggested by a few people. Uh, Hello Play Chess, I think, has the right idea. So b6, suggesting a takes. You have to take this pawn, right? If you don't take this pawn, um, then I'm just going to take one of your two. Whichever two you don't take with, right? If, say, you push this one, I take and I promote. So you have to take. And it doesn't actually make a difference which one you take with. A takes b6. And now the really, really clever move, c6. Noticing that this pawn is overworked. This pawn has to control two things. It has to stop you from this going here and from going here. Because now that I'm on c6, if I take, this pawn runs. And if I don't, this pawn gets home. So that's a really kind of very simple elementary example. And even though now black has two passed pawns, it doesn't matter because ours is closer. And we're going to be able to use a queen to pick off whatever pawns we need to. Um, so anything you can do to create a passed pawn, even if you have to break through. Now, this would be a different example if white's pawns were down here and black's pawns were up here, because then even if we break through, black is still going to be closer. So you do want to be aware of how close someone is to promotion. Um, but yeah, another really important idea is looking at some of these types of breakthroughs. Finally, one quick note is again with the rooks and the pawns. So with pawn promotion, Rooks, nine out of 10 times, belong behind the passed pawn. Uh, the reason for this is, well, there's a few ideas. One, if you try and defend it from the side, I mean, in this example, we would have to get a little more creative than that because we're going to get a back rank. But um, if you try and defend the pawn from the side, the problem you run into is that any time it moves, you're no longer controlling it with your rook. So your rook is going to, you're going to have to control it another way and then move the rook and shuffle. And it's just a really awkward process. If you want to try and control it from the front here again, let's do something like this. Then this is going to work a little better, but unfortunately at some point your pawn is actually going to get uh, stuck. The rook is actually in the way. So the best way to defend it when possible is to move the rook behind the passed pawn. Because now we can push it safely, knowing that our rook controls not only the pawn, but also every square it's going to go without getting in the way. So if you have a choice about where to put a rook to help support a passed pawn, put it behind. And this is true, sorry, whether you're attacking or defending. Um, if white plays, you know, this move to try and defend it from the other side or from the side, however they choose, now black's rook gets the same benefit. They're attacking this pawn on the square it's on right now and every square it will go to. So putting rooks behind past pawns is a really good idea.
That is all the time we have for tonight, but thank you so much for joining. Um, hopefully you learned something about ponds that maybe you didn't know before, or maybe you knew it all, but thanks for coming anyway. Um, please stick around. Our next uh, lecture will be uh, by Grandmaster uh, Alexander Yermolinsky. Should be really fun, so feel free to stick around and enjoy it, and I hope to see you again soon.